Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, county prepares for the Delta variant. Does this mean lockdowns are in Montgomery County's future again? County executive proposes new energy reducing bill. Former Lieutenant Governor Michael Steele creates an exploratory committee. And special guest commentator will discuss the county's commission on redistricting. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former county council member and founder of SkillSmart, a technology startup uh, working to build stronger communities, Mike Knapp, Secretary of the Montgomery County Federation of Republican Women, Lori Halverson, and our special guest, Mariana Cordier, Chair of the Commission on Redistricting. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. During the last election, Montgomery County voters passed an amendment to the county charter to increase the number of county council members from 9 to 11. They also increased the number of council manic districts from 5 to 7. With us today is Mariana Cordier, Chair of the Commission on Redistricting, to give 21 This Week viewers an update on, the, on its efforts. Welcome, Mariana. Thank and you I'll, for having me on the show. <laughs> we've been wanting you on for months. I'm so glad we're able to do this. So this is great. Tell me about the challenges that you've encountered along the way here. Well, one of the largest uh, challenges for us is uh, when the information from the census, the last census of 2020 will be released. Uh, typically, it's released by the end of July, and we are scheduled to receive it unless, you know, something changes um, at the end of September. And um, according to uh, the laws and, and, and the rules, we are supposed to provide um, the redrawn district maps in November. I believe it's November 11th. And so... Uh, the time frame between when we get the census information and to our deadline is tight. Um, so we've taken the opportunity uh, during this period that, you know, we started having meetings once a month. It's the second Wednesday. Anybody can watch it. You don't have to have Facebook, but they're, they're running it on face, uh, Facebook Live. Um, it's the second Wednesday of every month, um, and um, it's at... 5 p.m. to 6.30. Um, I think they record them so you can go to the council website and, and watch a meeting if you missed it. Um, and we invite comments on the chat. But really, we've spent the time to try to educate people what is redistricting really? Um, what is it? What are we actually doing? Uh, and, and what are the parameters? Uh, what are we legally obligated to do? And what do we have to consider? And so um, it's been good for us as a commission, for all commissioners to be on a level playing field of understanding, you know, our, our obligations and what it is we're actually doing. So that, that, that's been helpful. It's given us that time. And also to educate the community, right? To let everybody know that community involvement is super important because I'm super committed to transparency. Um, I think that for this process to work and to be fair, um, as much as fair as we can be, um, we really need the participation and input of, of, of Montgomery County residents. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question about sure. that. Because the, 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 when, you, we, when you create two additional council districts, are you doing it based on voter population or overall population in, the, in these areas? And are you trying to shape them along existing uh, election precincts? So we have determined ground rules um, for and, and agreed to what our ground rules are going to be. And, and part of that is a combination of things that have evolved through uh, challenges to uh, districts that have been drawn and then um, litigated for gerrymandering. Um, and um, and also what our best practice is. So kind of pulled from various resources um, and we came up with these ground rules. We are looking for equal population 
um, for the district. And that is actually, you know, a Fourth Amendment, a 14th Amendment obligation. So that, that, that's one. Compactness, we're, we're trying to maintain that, you know, we don't have any weird, you know, designs, you know, that it, it looks right. Uh, contiguity, you know, we, we want all parts of the districts being connected at some point with the rest of the district. We want to take into consideration minority representation. Uh, we do want to look at preservation of political subdivisions. And then the big one that really sparks a lot of debate is the preservation of communities of interest. And, and for everyone to understand what that actually means, it's a distinctive units which share common concerns with respect to, and it could be geography, demography, ethnicity, culture, socioeconomic status, or trade. So if we can, and then once we have all of that identified um, with the maps and the layers, you know, then there starts to be a bit of a competition, if you will, or a contest of values that might, because some values may conflict with others. And that's where um, I think the community input is important for us to know what is important to our Montgomery County residents. Um, and, and that's where we kind of have to try to figure out how to do the best that we can. Have you had an opportunity to meet with all the stakeholders, particularly the two political parties? And how do you bring in the independent voice? So what we have done is we have created um, a community outreach. So any group that wants to invite us to come speak, and when I say us, I mean, it'll be one, two, three commissioners at most, three at most, because if not, it becomes a, you know, a public meeting and there's rules that apply. So um, we will come out and give a presentation about what I just talked about and some other information. Um, and then we listen. That's the big thing. We listen to what that group has to say and what their concerns are. And we take that back to the commission and we say, these communities have these concerns. And so that's why we've been pushing really hard to be able to do that. And for those who are challenged for equity reasons or technology reasons, I'm challenged technology-wise, we're, we're working to have three public meetings um, one in up county, one in the center of the county, one in down county. I'm, I'm shooting for September. I think September will be a really great time before the information comes out to open to the public. So well, if you don't belong to a single group, you can come to these public forums. And we are creating on the website a form that you can put your comments in. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time for this segment. And we'd, we'd love to have you come back in September. Uh, sure. uh, to uh, you know, give us further detail on on your efforts. So, and we greatly appreciate your being with us today. So, thank you, Mariana. Appreciate your appreciate your being here. Thank you so much for having. Me. We will bring in our regular panel, Mike Knapp and Lori Halverson. Okay. So, Mike and and Lori, you heard you know kind of a the challenges that this redistricting uh, commission uh, is taking into account, but it also uh, you heard uh, how well organized and the presentation is they're trying to take everyone's vo uh, voice into concern. Mike, what are your concerns after listening to uh, a bit of the process? I think the process she outlined is, is a good process. And I think you're right. Because of the delay they have in getting the census numbers, I think it's given them an opportunity to really think through how they want to approach it once they finally get those numbers. I think the challenge is always the challenge. Redistricting is typically among the most political things that occurs. And so people have vested interests from a political perspective. But I think that we have a really good opportunity now to get good representation across the county. I mean, most of our elected folks within the county council right now, all but two live south of Rockville or south of Kensington. And so you have almost two thirds of the county's land area and half of their people represented by effectively by two council members. I realize the at-large members would, would would argue with that a little bit, but they all live down county too. And so I think to be able to reallocate that in a way that gets us a little broader representation throughout the county would be great. Lori, uh, are, are you comfortable with the process that, that's been described? Uh, how, uh, how involved have you been? Yeah, I haven't been too involved in this whole process myself, but I've been paying attention to some of the news going back and forth. And I do have concerns that the Republicans are underrepresented because we don't have as many Republicans as the, there are more independents than there are uh, 
there are more independents than there are in Republicans in this county. So I'm concerned that we could still be gerrymandered out. A number of our elected officials were gerrymandered out in the past. Um, and I'd like to, to see a fair process. I do think that they're committed to trying to do to have a fair process, but I'm concerned that maybe not enough Republicans may show up. So I hope when there are public meetings that a lot of conservative people will show up and, and speak out because it's really important for them to hear our voices. Well, we have to, we have to, we have to go to break, but it was said on this on the air about three weeks ago by uh, a member on the commission that uh, the Republican Central Committee did not has not as as of yet requested a a, uh, a, a the, the commission come in to describe the process to them. So uh, we'll see what happens with the public meetings in September. When we come back from this short break, former Lieutenant Governor Michael Steele creates an exploratory committee, and County Executive Mark Elrich proposes new energy reducing legislation. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Less than a month after all Corona 19, coronavirus 19 uh, restrictions imposed by the state of Maryland and Montgomery County were lifted, it was disclosed this week that Montgomery County is now making contingency plans in response to the increase in the Delta variant COVID cases. Lori, the headlines in the media report in alarming detail that we are in the midst of a surge in COVID 19 cases. But if you look at the county COVID-19 dashboard, the statistics suggest only a small uptick in reported cases and that an inpatient hospitalization of COVID-19 patients is actually less than 1.1%. So is the news media accurately reporting what is going on? Yeah, the news media likes to spread fear because that's good for business. But there's uh, there were 61 cases in Montgomery County today uh, as we're taping, and there were over 500 cases in the state of Maryland. So I do think there is a cause for concern among the unvaccinated. But for the vaccinated, you know, I just think the messages are not uh, consistent when it's very confusing. There's three points I want to make. Um, the first is that there's not a comparable increase in the number of hospitalizations and deaths when you look at the number of cases. And the, the people that are in the hospital, or the, most of them, are the ones with um, who've not been vaccinated. The second point is that wasn't the goal at the beginning of the pandemic to slow the spread so that we would have room in the hospitals, but there's 1.1% in the hospitals with COVID right now. That's a good thing. Uh, and Fauci is now saying the reason is that we're putting our masks back on is because of a change in the virus. Yet he says it's okay, you know, if that we're protected if we're fully vaccinated. That's confusing to people. Uh, the third point is that we have, uh, we've seen Texas today had over 10,000 cases. There are people crossing the border who are infecting other people. And why is the uh, Biden administration not doing anything about that? Because there's, there's people coming through the border and spreading it, and we should be reinstating those Trump policies to, uh, you know, if they really mean business, we should start seeing some changes there. Well, let's, let's stay focused here on, on what, what's going on in the county. Um, and Mike, nobody in, in, in their right mind would want to go back to, to lockdowns again. Right. And as Lori pointed out, the, the number of fatalities in the county attributed to COVID-19 in June, which was the most recent report, was 13. And not to, not to dismint, diminish or uh, the, 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 those fatalities in any way, but to put it in context, at the height of the pandemic in April of 2020, for the month of April, there was there was 284 deaths. So we're, there's a different magnitude. So are we re overreacting to some small increases in infections? Well, I mean, I think, and Lori referenced this, I think biology does change things. So the virus has mutated and it does different things. And so to think that there's a static environment, that's not how biology works. And so while people want to think that's confusing, yeah, it is but that's how biology and science operate. So we need to pay attention to it and try and get ahead of it. That being said, I don't think it's horrible to have a contingency plan, but I agree with you. I think the numbers that we have so far in the county indicate that we're, we've done a good job. We have more than 70% vaccinated, at least with a single dose. And so I think those things have worked well. My concern, I think place we gotta pay attention to is the transmissibility of the Delta variant um, and people as, as people can carry that and, trans, and the transmissibility of it, I think impacts our children. 
I mean, we know those but up to the, under the age of 12 are still are still vulnerable, and so I think we have to pay attention to that. I don't think we have good have great answers for that, but I think we need to know and we need to pay attention. We shouldn't be putting them at risk when we know that there are challenges out there to be addressed. Well, that may be true, and and we don't have time in this segment to really get into the details. But you know, again. Uh, children or individuals under the age of 18 are the le least susceptible to COVID-19 and, um, and uh, problems from COVID-19. So again, it's a question of, of a balancing between yes. what is healthy for children and what is unhealthy. And there are reports that say mask wearing on a regular basis for long extended periods of times is not healthy for children. But so, we are also seeing an increase in that population with the Delta in response to the Delta variant as well. And so, that, so again, I don't disagree. I think to your point, there there is a middle ground that needs to be achieved, and and we need to continue to strive to get to that point. And having a contingency plan, I think, helps us get there. But I don't. I have yet to see any indication or any benchmarks to say how those contingency Delta will get into put into place. And I think it's pretty important to make that really clear to folks what the next steps would be. Yeah, but my, my the, the idea that a mask. And this is a Fauci mask, it's a Washington national mask, uh, is gonna protect us and protect everybody, I think is foolish. I think vaccination is the way to go. Sure it is, and that's sure it is. But we've got 100 million people out there that don't wanna get vaccinated. So what do we do when that, when that, when that doesn't work? Well, and, and, let, let, and they're getting they, more firmly entrenched. They have, they have the right and the privilege of not being vaccinated. Well, then what's our next step? Because they're the ones that are now, now spreading, the, spreading the virus. Uh, you can spread the virus even if you've been vaccinated. This, this, this is a really uh, devilish disease that we're, mm -hmm. that we're dealing with. It Unfortunately, we got, we're out of time, and I, wanna, I do want to touch on a rather complicated plan that was, that was put forth by County Executive Mark Elrich. And we all know that he's an unapologetic environmentalist. And this week he announced the first of its kind energy reducing bill that will mandate building energy performance standards. And it's first of its kind in Maryland. It's been done elsewhere. I don't want to suggest that this is uh, something totally novel, but it's really dense. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of details to it. And, but Mike, the goal of the building energy standards is sustainability with goals of reducing energy use by 50%. And according to the press release, reducing carbon emissions by 80% by 2027. Is this a realistic goal? Um, I think it's certainly a an ambitious goal, and unfortunately, I think this is one of the things that governments do really poorly. It's really easy to come up with a goal and establish a set of mandates and say, good, the rest of you guys figure out how you're going to implement this, and I'm just going to establish the benchmarks and make sure that you're meeting or exceeding those benchmarks or not and let you know that you're not. And I think it's going to be really important if we're going to address climate change, really, that we actually establish the goals that we're trying to achieve, and then put in place the tools that people can use to make that happen. Whether that's additional resources, clear objectives, putting those pieces together, but it can't be as just setting a mandate saying, here, here's my goal, you guys need to figure out how to get there. Well, I think the one thing you left out of, and I think all of your proposals are, are, are reasonable, is a cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I wanna go to Lori on this, you know, the, these additional building standards, while they're admirable in nature, have a cost to them. And is this going to discourage new commercial development in the county? <laughs> yeah, I think you have to look at what is this going to do to businesses and how will it affect the cost to the residents of this county? Uh, and is it worth it to be the first in line in the country to be, you know, revolutionary in this area when it could end up hurting our residents? Um, aren't we supposed to be luring businesses here? I, I think that uh, we need to look more closely at the cost benefit analysis and what is this going to do to the residents and is it going to cost us a lot more money? Um, you know, it may make a lot of people leave. Uh, a lot of businesses may not come here. Well, the first the businesses aren't coming here right now, so that's, that's, that's our bigger challenge. <laughs> yes. uh, well, we, we have an election coming up in uh, in a little over a year, uh, uh, so that maybe that'll, that'll address that issue as well. Uh, we have to move on to our, our next topic, dealing with elections. Former Lieutenant Governor Michael Steele announced this week that he is forming an, an exploratory committee and is considering running for governor as a Republican. Lori, Steele was an effective lieutenant governor under Bob Ehrlich and narrowly lost in a race to Ben Cardin in a U.S. Senate race. So what do you make of his potential candidacy? 
I am stunned that he is actually considering running for governor. Uh, I read an article recently and about him, and it didn't mention that he was part of the Lincoln Project. That was something that was, you know, it's one thing to be a Republican who disagrees with Trump, but to be a Republican who actively and vehemently goes against the president of the United States. And, and you know, that's just really bothers me that he's thinking he could actually have a chance in Maryland now. He blew it, in my opinion, when he got involved with the Lincoln Project. I mean, and he said he would vote for, for Biden. And so that means he's for many of the things that Biden is doing right now. He's got, he's opened the border. He's shut down um, the pipeline. He's allowed uh, men to compete with women in sports. I mean, what kind of person runs for governor who's a Republican and thinks he's going to win? Doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> So uh, you're saying how you, you really feel, Lori? You don't have. Tell us how you really feel, Lori. You didn't <laughs> have a chance. <laughs> so, Mike, I guess it's uh, if, uh, if by miracle of miracles, if if uh, Steele wins, uh, would he have appeal across the the in an inst you know in, in a statewide race to voters? Well, I, I think we've had Larry Hogan as governor for two terms. Um, we've had Bob Ehrlich prior to that. I think it's realistic to think that a um, a moderate Republican candidate can win in, win in the state of Maryland. And so whether that's Kelly Schultz or that's Michael Steele, I think that I think there's an opportunity there. I think it's up to the Democrats to actually put a strong candidate out there to, to, to make that not happen. But um, I think certainly it's, it's viable. <laughs> we tiptoed around that issue. <laughs> I, I love Michael. He's a, he's, he was, I've known him for 20 plus years since the, since the uh, Sour Bray, um, uh, uh, election or campaigns, but uh, I I, th I think Lori is right. He'll have a hard time finding Republican primary voters to support him uh, yeah. in this effort. Stay tuned for parting shots when we come back from the short break. Welcome back with parting shots, Lori Halverson. Yes, well, since we're not taping in August, I know that you're going to be looking, what can I do? Um, because you, we're not going to be on TV. So uh, so one thing I would like to suggest is uh, to enjoy the Montgomery County Agriculture Fair. It is uh, a great time in the summer. It's outdoors if you know, you're know you not as likely to get coronavirus if you're walking around outside. Uh, so so uh, enjoy it. You can park for free at Lake Forest Mall, and, uh, and they have a lot of entertainment and rides. It's great fun for the family. Thank you, Lori. Oh, and it's August 13th through the 20th. I don't think I said that. Wonderful. Thank you. Mike Knapp, your parting shot. I agree with Lori. Everybody go to the fair. It's a great thing to do for the county. And I just want to wish everyone a wonderful vacation since we actually get to have one this year. So please be safe, enjoy it, and enjoy time with others and um, come back and see us in September. Thank you, Mike. And as both Lori and Mike indicated, we all identify as French during, during the month of August and we go to vacation. Of course, we aren't going to San Moritz or, or the Riviera, but we are, going, we are going away. And we will see you in September, unless we lose you to a summer love. Take care.